Hey guys, welcome to week four. This is the end of chapter 30, uh, the end of Fundamentals of Pharmacology. This week you'll still have an assignment and forum, just like always, but you'll also have your first test that will cover everything from weeks one through four. So, assignment, as always, just submit on Moodle, forum, 250 word minimum response, and then also two responses to your classmates um, of at least 100 words each. If you have any questions, email me earlier rather than later. Um, that way we can get whatever questions you have resolved before the test is due on Sunday night and everything else is due on Sunday night. So let's get started. Your reading today goes from page 864, I believe, to 87, well, pretty much the end of the chapter. So um, make sure you take a look at that and then listen to this lecture. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about drug resources, where we get our information. This is very important. Um, so resources can range from anything from the internet all the way down to a very, very specific manufacturer insert to a physician's desk reference. When I teach my students at St. Peter's, I like to tell them it's okay to Google things, but really you want to have a good resource, guidelines, evidence-based medicine guidelines, or a physician's desk reference, or maybe you use Lexicomp or Micromedics. When you work in a facility, they should give you access to these sorts of things. But if not, pick yourself up a good nursing drug book. That'll give you everything you need to know. A little bit less um, detailed than, say, a Lexicomp or a Micromedics, but still what you need to know for your job. <clears throat> so, the Physician's Desk Reference is published every year by PDR, li Limited License Company. Um, it's one of the most popular drug references. However, um, in real life, it is a giant book that is very hard to move around and has a ton of different sections and gets updated pretty much, I think, every month. They'll send you paper updates. In the digital world that we're moving into, Physician's Desk Reference is sort of falling out of popularity. As you can see, Table-30-5, the PDR sections, pay close attention to this. There is a homework question on these sections. So the colors, the titles, and the description there. Uh, U.S. Pharmacopeia National Formulary. Again, this is listed as one of your references, but you may never see one of these in your life, to be quite honest with you. These are, a lot of these are moving away from paper print and into internet standards. And unfortunately, um, we don't use the PDR or the USP as much as we used to. What we do use is drug product package inserts. I look at these all the time when I'm looking for information about um, maybe specific pharmacokinetic information, how long does the drug last, how do I dilute it, how do I administer it, um, and it may also include specific clinical findings and studies. Oh boy, apparently it's uh, doggy bark time. Um, like I said, a nursing drug book is another great resource. Uh, drug resources on the internet, such as Hippocrates or, um, again, Lexicomp or Micromedics, if your facility offers access to those, are also wonderful resources. So, medication preparation, safe drug administration. Really, medication should be prepared and administered in a well-lit area, um, if at all possible. You want to avoid becoming distracted when you're preparing medications, and you will also want to check your drug to make sure it hasn't reached expiration and that it's been stored correctly. This is all going to cut down on drug errors, so we're looking at expiration dates on the vial. Does the vial look normal? If it's clear and see-through, does it have any crystals in it? Should it have been in a refrigerator for the past six months and instead it's been sitting out at room temperature? If you're unfamiliar, just call the pharmacist and ask them to help you. They will certainly be able to do that over the phone. Let's move on to the seven rights of drug administration. We're going to talk a lot about this in our forum, in our homework, and right here and now. So the first one's the right patient. We want to make sure we have the right patient name and we can verify that with the patient by having them spell their name or get another identifier perhaps a date of birth or the last four of their social security number. Sometimes with newer technology, we can even scan the patient's wristband with a machine. Regardless though, we don't identify patients by the room numbers because those change all the time, right? So we want to pick out something about the patient that's not going to change and we want to use at least two identifiers. Want to make sure we have the right drug. We're going to check the label a minimum of three times to confirm that it's the right drug and the right strength and we're going to compare that to the written order or the computerized order. Read the drug label when removing the medication from the storage area, when preparing the medication, and when putting the medication back into the storage area. That's going to make sure that you put it back in the right place. The right dose. So we may need to perform calculations, double check those calculations. We may have the dose just written out for us. Maybe it says 0.5 mLs. 
um, always making sure that the dose matches the milligrams or the units that are being ordered. Next, we want the right route. Is it being given intramuscularly? Perhaps it's being given by mouth or IV. Always make sure you're giving the right route and that you have the right medication that is allowed to be given by that route. A lot of oral syrups cannot be given IV and vice versa. Sometimes you can't give IV medications PO, so make sure you have the right route. The right time. Um, usually not a factor in ambulatory health centers. However, um, if you're in a hospital, you may find that certain medications need to be administered at night, certain meds in the morning. Sometimes they have to be spaced. So keep that in mind. The right technique. Uh, we're going to want to learn the procedure for proper drug administration and uh, make sure that we're administering it properly, whether that's an IM injection, setting up an IV, maybe giving a subcutaneous injection, or having the patient place a medication under their tongue. So making sure you know the right technique, and if you don't, asking someone for help. Last but not least, number seven, the right documentation. If you didn't document it, it didn't happen, right? So if you don't write it down, if you don't put it in the patient's chart, you never gave it, and you can't prove that you did. Document right away. Don't wait. Otherwise, you might forget. So most of each HR programs include templates that can be used for drug information, and that might include expiration dates, how you gave the medication, what route, um, what time, etc. And that keeps track of all of that for you, which is awesome. So we usually ah. wait 20 to 30 minutes following drug administration. If the patient's going to have a reaction, it's going to happen in that time. Safety and continuity in medication administration. So we're going to PAD, prepare, administer, and document. This is a homework question, pay close attention. Chain of events performed by only one person during medication administration. And there's that adage, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. So we're going to prepare our medication. We're in well area, we're going to administer following the seven rights, and then we're gonna document the heck out of this medication. So common reasons that um, medication errors happen. Not reading the label carefully. Confusing a drug with another drug that is spelled. This is called look-alike, sound-alike. Not calculating a dosage correctly. But we're going to fix that in week five and six. You guys are going to know how to calculate doses. Or trying to multitask while preparing a medication. You should always focus on the task at hand and nothing else, right? Um, we can give a thousand reasons, reasons that medication errors happen. Just when you think you've got it figured out and you think you're no longer vulnerable to med medication errors, you'll find another hole in the, the whole preparation part where you're like, oh my gosh, I just made an error and I didn't even know it was possible to make an error there. So always be vigilant for vulnerabilities. If a medication error occurs, own up to it. You own that, you stop right there, you admit to what you've done, remain calm, notify the physician right away, assess the patient for any reaction. We're gonna take vital signs and look for signs of distress. And you're also, after you speak to the physician, if they tell you to, you're going to want to speak with the patient and let them know what's happened. Again, they might be angry, they might not even care, but regardless, they need to know what's happened to them as well. You're gonna document, again, in the patient's chart. If you didn't document it, it happens still, and somebody knows about it, but you could get in trouble. And if your facility has a procedure for documenting errors, you're going to want to document there as well. I just want to say a word about medication errors. At some point, you will make one. At some point, you'll make an error that doesn't have medication related to it. Maybe it's an error in documenting vital signs. Relax. Take a deep breath. We are human. It's going to happen, but we need to identify ways to make it not happen. All right, we're, so we're picking out those vulnerable spots and we're making sure that we don't make the same mistake over and over again. I've made mistakes. Every single one of my colleagues has made mistakes. We just hope that they're not so serious and that we can identify where serious mistakes might happen. So let's talk about some different routes of administration now that we know how um, what the seven rights are. So first is enteral, and this means anything pertaining to the alimentary canal or the intestines. It includes things like oral medications, sublingual, rectal routes, anything that's going to work its way through the GI system. Parenteral means pertaining to besides or outside of the intestine. Perhaps topical, transdermal, maybe absorbed through the mucosa, maybe injectable, inhalation. There's a lot of different parenteral routes. So oral medications. Oral medications come in a variety of different forms. Tablets, caplets, capsules solution suspensions, um, sublinguals. So we're going to only want to give these to conscious patients who can swallow without any difficulty. And this says, see table 
for your examples. There's a lot more than just that. I would say C table 30-7 as well, right? And the, I'm not going to go through exactly how to administer the way they have the pictures there. Um, read through that and make sure you're familiar with it. And next week, you see that cup there on page 869. We're going to talk about the different conversions. Actually, I guess I am going to talk about it. I forgot about this slide. So buccal is placed between the gums of the upper molars and inside cheek. You see the tablet right here, or a sublingual is under the tongue. Sub meaning under, lingual meaning tongue. And these will just dissolve over time. Some of them super quick, some of them take a little bit of time. Oral medications, liquids. We usually use liquids in children or maybe older adults who have trouble swallowing big pills. Um, and again, we're going to talk about these conversions next week. For oral syringes, we want to make sure that these aren't hooked up to an IV line and given. So you'll usually see that they're a little different. They don't necessarily have the uh, lure lock at the end. We can give medication through feeding tubes for patients who are unconscious or in a vegetative state or maybe have difficulty swallowing. Um, Again, medical assistants may or may not administer medications through this route, depending on the state that they're in. We can give medications rectally for patients with GI disturbances or kids, those who are unconscious or have difficulty swallowing. Parenteral routes. This is administered outside of the GI tract, and the advantage is super quick absorption and faster response time, 100% bioavailability at time zero. You don't have to wait for the drug to break down and be absorbed. Um, Absence of side effects, not always. The yeah, parenteral routes still have their side effects. They just might be a little different and maybe not related to the tummy. Disadvantages, um, you can't take it away once you put it in there. And rapid onset um, of anaphylaxis can happen. In addition, with needles, there's always the possibility for injury. So we're going to go pretty quick through these, ooh, through these last parts. Um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Okay. So mucosal membrane medications, think eyes, ears, nose, and vaginal membranes. These are medications that get absorbed through very um, vascular areas, such as the ones I just mentioned. Um, usually absorption is pretty good. Sometimes um, it can just be treating that local area. Um, and I would say usually 99% of the time, that's what we're looking for. These medications aren't getting absorbed into systemic systems. Topical applications, again, localized actions, maybe lotions, liniments, or ointments. These can be used for itching, pain relief, um, moisturizing, etc. Transdermal patches, adhesive patches applied to the skin, and these adhesive patches have been loaded up with medication and have these special matrices to allow for slow release into the blood, bloodstream. So there's some examples of um, how medications are given. If you guys have any questions, feel free to um, reach out to me. If you need examples or if you want to know more about a certain route, just let me know. Um, the book does give a few good examples of each of these. So, again, homework assignment, forum, one original response, two classmate responses, and a test. I'll do this Sunday by midnight. I hope you guys have a great week. Um, next week we move on to math. Don't be nervous. You're going to do great. And I'll see you there.